Hello and good afternoon or good morning to some people and welcome to the webinar we have here for governance. This is our first in a series on governance that we are delivering and um, hopefully you can see us. Um, I am Anna Rollinson. If you haven't met me before, I am in the SETSCOP manager role here at MCA. And I am very happy to welcome you to this session so that we can learn more about what is a board. Um, and next fortnight, we'll be talking also about what a board member does. I'm happy uh, to welcome you from, I'm joining you today from the lands of the Yagara and Turrbal people. And I'd just like to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging of the lands that I come from today, the lands that we now call Australia. And I'd like to acknowledge any indigenous colleagues that are joining us on the line. And I would also like to introduce Derek, who is here to talk to us today on this topic. Derek is doing this presentation as he is uh, here, having done a number of executive management positions in the, in the non-government space, as well as in businesses, um, having had different executive director and non-executive director positions, again, in both commercial and not-for-profit spaces, having been in the role of a company secretary, having consulted and coached different boards, as well as having done research, his doctoral research in strategic management and decision making. Um, he's also completed two master's degrees in management and business admin and a graduate from the Australian Institute of Company Directors. So we're very happy to have him here to talk about this topic and be able to share some of his knowledge and wisdom that he's gained through all of his experience and studies. I would also just like to let you know that we won't be taking questions until the end of the session today, but we will be um, asking you to use the Q&A function so you can submit your questions there. So now I will hand over to Derek. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Welcome everybody. Good afternoon. I'm just going to straight away, I will share my screen here and um, yep, there we go. Hello everybody. I hope everyone has dry feet today and uh, has managed to, to, uh, to maintain their, their spirit in these last couple of weeks when uh, when uh, a large chunk of the East Coast has been, been impacted by these storms. And I certainly hope that wherever you are, that that hasn't impacted you too much today. So getting right into it, um, uh, as Anna said, we'll take questions at the end because we've got, this is quite a, a, big, a big topic in terms of corporate governance. Uh, we'll spread it over three webinars over the next um, month or so. Um, it is a big topic and what we're trying to do in the space of an hour is present, you know, a lot of material that uh, is quite detailed and quite explicit in its nature. So I think if we took questions as we went, it would take a lot longer than the time that we have available. Okay. So uh, as Anna said, throw your questions in there and we'll attempt to, to get those answered at the end of the, uh, the session today. Um, it's a very dry topic. It's not a very sexy topic, corporate governance. So um, I'm hoping that I can put a bit of color to it and get you through it quickly and, and get, for those that perhaps are on boards, I don't know the audience here in terms of how many are actually on boards today. Those that uh, are considering starting a board, those that are considering joining a board, as, as a director or as a committee member, or perhaps those that are just simply interested or trying to better understand, well, what is these things called the board? What are they there for and how do they work? So it's perhaps presenting context as to why they exist, where they come from and, uh, and the like. So 
Our series is uh, three webinars. Today, we're talking about what is a board. And in doing that, we have to talk about, well, what is a company? And in particular, what we're talking about here is in the not-for-profit space, okay? Next one, we talk about the role of a director, so the role of the individual on the board. And then the third webinar in a few weeks' time, we're going to talk about how the boards work. And in particular, a very important part, uh, and that is the role of the board in setting the tone from the top. So the role of the board in terms of the culture, setting the culture for the organisation and what responsibility does the board have with regard to culture? So for, before we get, begin, just some clarity. I just wanted to simplify some terms that are relatively interchangeable, okay? So sometimes when we talk about boards in some organisations, they refer to the board as the management committee. Board, management committee, generally a board is for a larger organisation, a larger not-for-profit, and a management committee is for a smaller one. In, with regard to the role of the board and the management committee, they're no different. And so, so I don't have to keep saying board management committee, board management committee like that. We'll just refer to it as the board here, just for clarity. The same with the members of the board in larger organization, they are often referred to as directors. Uh, in smaller ones, committee members. And again, they're interchangeable terms, the roles, responsibilities, directors and management committee members, very, uh, very, very insignificantly, depending on the size of the board. So we're just gonna call them directors because it is all equally applicable. Likewise, and we'll talk about this, you know, a bit later, we do a few comparisons with commercial or for-profit equivalents, um, but you would have heard uh, of shareholders and the shareholders being, being the owners, if you like, of, of a company, of a commercial company. You can't own a not-for-profit, folks. I'm not sure if everybody understands that, but you can't actually own it. There are no shareholders as such. There are no owners. The equivalent in a not-for-profit of a shareholders is what we call its members. Um, and so when we talk about members or shareholders in this discussion around corporate governance, members play the role of shareholders. They're, they're completely and totally interchangeable. The only difference is, is that in a not-for-profit, you can't distribute profit back to the owners or back to the shareholders. Members don't receive a profit back, okay? So let's get started. You know, what we're gonna talk about today is what is a board, specifically in the not-for-profit setting? Uh, why do we have boards? What is corporate governance? Some of you may be familiar with the term governance in different contexts, such as clinical governance. Here, we're talking about corporate governance, which has a particular purpose and a particular role to play. In doing so, we have to look at what are the types of not-for-profit companies. And they basically form into two groups, those that are what we call incorporated, and those that are unincorporated. So we're going to talk about the difference between that and how that impacts, if you like, aspects to corporate governance. We also need to talk about the regulators. And then there are a lot of regulators when you're on a board and there are a lot of regulators for companies. And we need to talk about those because it's really important that the board uh, and, and direct understand those regulators and they often depending on the regulator, often um, insist that organisation meet certain governance standards. We're also going to look at the constitution. The constitution is a document that defines, amongst many other things, the purpose. And this is the piece that is very different from a commercial organisation to a not-for-profit. A not-for-profit organisation stands for social purpose. It's not there to return you know, an investment back to shareholders. As we said, there are no owners. It's not there for a commercial purpose. It is there for a social purpose. And the constitution is where that social purpose is defined. And in many commercial organizations, the constitution doesn't play as big a role as it does in a not-for-profit because within the constitution, we define the social purpose, the reason that exists, if you like. We're going to look at the roles and the functions of the board 
And in doing that, we're going to look at the delineation between the roles of members, boards, and managers. So we're going to look at what's it mean to be governing versus managing. And in all my experience, where problems exist in governance and in not-for-profits, it's generally in the greyness of the areas between boards and managers in particular, and sometimes between members. So it's important here, even in the short time that we have, we talk quickly about what it means to be on a board and to be governing and what it means to be a manager managing. A quick definition, there are a million definitions of corporate governance, but I, I chose this one because it actually brings into it, you know, the social context, if you like, of a board. And, and, and Clark said, corporate governance is concerned with holding the balance between economic and social goals and between individual and communal goals. The governance framework is there to encourage the efficient use of resources and equally to require accountability for the stewardship of those resources. The aim is to align as nearly as possible the interests of individuals, corporations and society. And we're going to talk a lot here in this whole series about this stewardship, you know, what, what we'll call later the fiduciary relationship and uh, don't get hung up on these kind of really technical, almost legal words. But it is very important that we understand that boards in particular have a stewardship over how the organisation is run the resources, particularly the financial resources and, and how they're applied and how they're used. So governance is about setting boundaries. The textbook answers to why we have boards, firstly one, to oversee the performance of the organization and at all times act in the best interest of the organization as a whole. And so I've underlined act in the best interest. And you're going to get sick of that term if you follow these three webinars. You're going to get sick of that because it's the role of the board and the role of the individual as a director to always act in the best interest of the organisation. And that can sometimes be quite grey and sometimes quite difficult because at times you have to leave your personal interests at the door and always be acting in the best interest of the organization. And we also will underline there as a whole. And so the organization as a whole, so not just a group, not just some members and not other members, not just one part of what the organization does forsaking another part of the organization. Governance has responsibility for the operation and performance of the organization as a whole. Second thing is to ensure the organization meets the shareholder member expectations whilst managing risk and complying with the law. And I can tell you folks, in operating a company, whether it's a commercial company or not-for-profit company, there are a lot of aspects with respect to compliance with the law. And managing risk, if we don't manage risk, we can't go forward. If we're not prepared to take risk, organizations can't go forward, but we have to manage risk appropriately and within a framework, okay? It's no good just being on a board and saying no to everything. That's not managing risk. Managing risk is sort of weighing up the benefits versus the, the, the risks and making a decision about how we move forward. Third thing, to bring skills, expertise, and an independent perspective to decision-making. So essentially the role of the board is to make decisions. And I've underlined the word independent there because we'll talk about this in the next webinar in particular. Um, we need uh, directors to be independent when they participate on boards and, and not to necessarily, again, uh, be bringing special interests or, or be, be collaborating around interests or, or, or whatever. They have to bring independence of mind position uh, and experience to the board. The fourth thing is to guide and support the CEO and the CEO's management team and hold them accountable for the performance of the organisation. So they're there in a coaching role, if you like, to provide guidance, 
but also to hold them accountable for how the organization is run. And that's not just financial performance. That's, that's many, many different aspects of running an organization from, from the, the top one, when I've been on boards, the top issue is always workplace health and safety. That staff have to go home in the same condition that they came to work in. And that is of paramount importance to the board. If the board don't take that seriously, the organization won't take that aspect seriously. And that is one example where, where the, uh, the board is uh, got that, that overview, if you like, that overview responsibility of holding management accountable for the performance of the organization. So let's just look at, go back in time. And if perhaps if we understand the history and evolution of governance, perhaps we can understand why things as they are, are as they are. So way back in, uh, the, in, the six, in 1600, if you like, and it was actually on the 31st of December, 1600, a company called the East India Trading Company. I'm sure many of you have studied history or, or, uh, or have a reasonable interest in history would, would, would know of the East India Trading Company. It was the first company that had the notion of shares, that people could buy a piece of a company, a share, if you like. So the notion of a shareholding came about. A royal charter was granted to the Company of Merchants in London to form what is called the East India Trading Company. It is probably, arguably, the first company ever, ever built, ever established. It began with 218 members. These were the first shareholders or the first members of an organisation. It had what was called the Court of Proprietors made up of members with voting rights. This was the first ever board. And then it had the Court of Directors, which was the first ever management team. So the Court of Proprietors sat, and sat above the management team and made sure that the management team you know, managed the organisation and its resources appropriately. It evolved from 31st of September to 1600. And then by the early 1900s, the size and complexity of companies had grown so that the role of boards and directors got so complex and so large that shareholders had to actually cede more powers to boards. It became impossible. If you can imagine here back in the East India Trading Company, it's impossible for 218 members to all manage an organisation. I think you'd all agree that. And so they delegated their responsibility to this, this board called the Court of Proprietors, who then delegated their responsibility to a group of managers. And by the 1900s, this got so complex that, that uh, the notion of a board and directors and managers have become well and truly established. Today, we have what is, is, is termed a corporation. And it was the East India Trading Company that was the first corporation. And what do we mean by corporation? Corporation is the act of incorporating. And what this means is that there is a legal separation of the organization, the company, from its members as being recognized in law as a quasi person. So if we have a company, a not for profit, and it's been incorporated, that company by law is recognized as a separate person, if you like, to the people that own it. So that legal separation means that, uh, that if, for example, if we, you know, a, a corporation that borrows money, that goes to the bank and borrows money, it is the corporation that is borrowing the money, not the owners. So if the corporation doesn't pay the money back, the bank can't pursue the owners or the members. They have to pursue the company, which by law is recognized as a quasi person. So incorporation is this legal separation of owners from company. So today, if somebody wants to sue an organization, they're suing the organization. They're not suing the members. 
They're not suing shareholders in the commercial space. They're suing the company, okay? This separation of ownership and control is known as the fiduciary relationship. So the members appoint directors to act on boards on their behalf. So the members choose directors to say, we are choosing new people to act on our behalf to oversee the management of this organization. That is known as the fiduciary relationship. In recent times, there's been a growth of, of legal frameworks to protect through leg regulation, this relationship between owners and members. Because obviously, if you delegate to a group of directors to manage the organization on their behalf, and they do the wrong thing, how are they protected? How are members' rights protected? How are, the, how are those assets and liabilities protected under law? And so due to, in recent times, many corporate failures in banking and different places, that legal framework in terms of how boards act and how directors act is quite complex and, and, and quite tight these days. And we'll talk about more of that in the next webinar, okay? A recent example of that is post Royal Commission to Aged Care. One of the areas I looked at was the standard of governance, the standard of boards. And now legislation post the Royal Commission to Aged Care has placed a lot more responsibility on boards to be more involved in what's happening in their aged care operation. So that's one example. And it's where boards, directors can be held accountable by those regulators for the decisions they make and their behaviours. Moving along to incorporate or not incorporate. So you don't have to, when you're setting up an organisation, incorporate. In fact, you can be unincorporated. So an incorporated organisation is today what we know as proprietary companies. These are private companies. And I'll show you a slide in a moment that compares these better. Public companies, and you would know public companies because they're on the stock exchange. So BHP, Westpac, uh, AGL, which is in the news lately. They're public companies where their ownership is listed on the stock exchange. And everyone from mum and dads to great big organizations buy, buy shares of those public companies cooperatives and what we call incorporated associations. Alternatively, unincorporated organizations can be sole traders, partnerships, trusts, and unincorporated associations. So for example, some of you may at different times started up a little business and might have then registered an ABN. You go on to ASIC, website, you register an ABN, I think it costs $70, and you have an Australian business number, and you start to then operate a business. That's known as being a sole trader, okay? And sometimes you might team up with a friend or a colleague or a family member, and you go and do the same thing in partnership. Those are examples of unincorporated businesses. And, and the biggest area, biggest difference between that and incorporated is there is no legal separation between you as the owner of that business and the business itself. So again, if you borrow money or somebody wants to sue you, they can sue you personally, as opposed to an incorporated organization where if they want to sue you or chase you for debts or liabilities or hold you accountable, they have to then go and hold the company accountable. Okay. In the not-for-profit space, they're the blue ones that I've mentioned on that slide there. So what we have are public companies. So you may be part of or know of companies, not-for-profit companies that have the term limited after them. They are public companies. They are companies that are not-for-profit, but they're being incorporated. So they have a board, they have members, and they have managers. Well, you might be part of a smaller not-for-profit, which is what we call 
an incorporated association. They often have the tag on the end of the company name as Inc. So we could have Acme Settlement Limited, which would be a company, a public company, or we could have Acme Settlement Incorporated, which would be an incorporated association. Or we can have an unincorporated association, which will have no tag at the end of it. It might just simply be Acme Settlement. And that's where the members and the organisation are not separated. And we'll talk about the pros and cons of that shortly. So the benefits of reason why of being incorporated include legal separation between the members, directors and managers. The organisation, as I said, is its own legal entity, a quasi person in the eyes of the law. There's also perpetual existence. If you are incorporated, if you are a company limited by guarantee and the members and directors may change over time, but the legal entity continues until action is taken and it is closed down. So it continues forever and ever, regardless of who the members are or the owners, regardless of who the directors are, regardless of who the managers are, they exist forever and a day until they're closed down or what we call being wound up. However, in an unincorporated organisation, such as an unincorporated association, when the, uh, when the members leave, the organisation is wound up. If the, if the uh, sole trader passes away, then the, the, the business also passes away as well. We also have the concept of limited liability. So because members have a stake through a membership fee in the organisation, um, if the organisation is, is closed down, is wound up, the liability, that is the amount that the member owes when the organisation is closed down, is limited to a very nominal amount. And it might just be the membership fee of $10 or something like that. The organisation's debts, liabilities belong to the organisation. They don't belong to members and directors. Okay, And that's the big advantage in being incorporated is it is a legal protection between those that are members, those that are directors, and the company itself, okay? So here we have a chart that shows that over on the, um, on, 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 I guess it must be your left as well as my left, are the two columns, proprietary and public. Proprietary company, the post designation is P2I Limited. I'm sure you've all seen companies that are saying P2I Limited. These are private commercial companies. They are governed by ASIC, the Australian Securities and Investment Commission. Um, they're shareholding are private owners, okay? And their liability is limited to the amount of shares that they have. So if you invest $100,000 in the company and the company goes bust, you've lost $100,000, no more than that, okay? A public company has the tag limited at the end of it. Uh, it is a public commercial company listed on the ASX. So its shareholders, its owners are listed on the Australian Stock Exchange. They're governed by ASIC. And again, their liability as, as shareholders are limit, uh, limited to their unpaid shareholding, which is usually zero. Then in the three columns on the right in blue, they are our not-for-profit companies. So in the big end of town, we have public companies which are what they call limited by guarantee. So they have the tag limited on the end of them. They are larger not-for-profits that wish to operate across state borders. So a company limited by guarantee can operate in any state or territory in the country. They are governed by the Australian Securities and Investment Commission and the ACNC, which we'll talk about in great depth in a moment. So the Australian Charities and Not-for-Profit Commission, okay? There's no shareholding, you can't own one. And members' liability is limited to the amount that is within the constitution, which I said is probably like $10 if, if that, okay? An incorporated association is, is kind of the medium-sized not-for-profit. It has the tag on the end of it, Inc. So as I said, Acme Settlement Inc. These are not-for-profits that are typically state-based. They are still incorporated, 
So they still have a board, often called a management committee, as we always said, they have a board, they have managers. There is that separation between the company and the board. They are governed by the relevant state authority. So in each state and territory, there is a different department that regulate charities and they govern those, those state-based charities. They're also governed again by the ACNC. And again, we'll talk about that. No shareholding, same thing, members limited to the nominal amount within the constitution or what we call the model rules. And then finally, an unincorporated association has no post designation. These are very small not-for-profit for a specific purpose. So if you were a community group that was wanting to protest a mine being put into your backyard, you might form an association to protest that in a group, okay? That's typically where you would find an unincorporated association. They are also governed by the relevant state authority in ACNC. There's no shareholding, you can't own them. But the difference here, and this is a big difference down the bottom um, right-hand corner, the liabilities reside equally across the members. So if there are six members, the liability, so if they borrowed money and they have to pay it back, that could go back to the members equally. And it's for this reason, folks, if you're considering starting a not-for-profit, you shouldn't consider an unincorporated association. My recommendation would be to, to not consider that type of structure. They're easy to set up, they're cheap to set up, but they present considerable liability for those involved. If it all goes wrong, it may end up back in your lap. Whereas the other versions, incorporated association, company limited by guarantee, you as a member starting that up and as a director are protected by that incorporation, that legal separation. So let's just talk about regulators and there are a few of them. So there are a lot of regulatory bodies that not-for-profit boards need to be aware of. Firstly, there is ASIC, the Australian Securities Investment Commission. It administers in Australia what is called the Corporations Act. And it is applicable for the larger not-for-profit companies, those that are said public companies limited by guarantees. The Corporation Act also has a lot to say about directors and their roles and responsibilities. We then have the ACNC and all of us in this room that are involved in not-for-profits will come under the, the, the watchful eye of the ACNC, the Australian Charities and Not-for-Profit Commission. Again, there's a relevant act appropriate to that. It is the independent regula regulator of charities and on all not-for-profits and charities should be registered with the ACNC. And we'll talk about that in a second. If in some way you're dealing with taking deposits or providing credit to somebody, or you were involved in superannuation or et cetera, or provide any insurance, if you happen to be doing that, and you may or may not in not-for-profit world, then you'll also be under the, under the watchful eye of APRA, the Australian Prudential Regulation Authority. These people in particular regulate our banking industry. Everybody, the whole, the whole of the country comes under the ATO, the Australian Tax Office. And uh, not-for-profits still have to, or most of them still have to submit a business activity statement for GST and pay-as-you-go tax. They also are involved in what is called DGR, so deductible gift registration. This is the ability of a charity to take a gift from somebody and that person who gave you that money, that donation can then go claim that on their tax return. Not all not-for-profits can do that. And many, many assume that because I'm a not-for-profit, I can accept the donation and then the person giving me that donation can go use it as a tax deduction. And that is not the case. And we'll talk about that in just a moment. But it's the tax office that ultimately say whether a particular charity can actually perform that function. There are also various state and territory regulators, mainly for associations, incorporated and unincorporated association. Others along the way, the ACCC, the EPA, you know, there are certain acts of parliament, et cetera, that boards need to be aware of, the Privacy Act, the Workplace Harmonisation Act, 
uh, fair work. There's, there's, a, there's a million of them. And all of these things, you know, if you're on a board, you need to be aware of how those different authorities apply to your organisation, your board and your role. So the ACNC actually has governance standards for charities and not-for-profits. And if you just look at these quickly, the per first and foremost, they dictate, uh, or, or, or if you like, they review whether a charity has a valid charitable purpose. And if you're a not-for-profit registered with the ACNC, you have to provide information about that social purpose to the ACNC. They review it and determine whether you're a charity or not. And so if you're just starting out, starting up a not-for-profit company, you have to spend the time on that. You have to spend the time. A commercial equivalent doesn't have that, but this is what se se separates not-for-profits apart. And this becomes important in many different areas. Uh, it also has the standard that, that boards must be accountable to their members and they must take reasonable steps to be accountable to communicate and provide them adequate opportunity to raise their concerns about how the not-for-profit is governed. This is often done in what is called the annual general meeting, the AGM. Okay, we'll talk about that briefly. The standard also says that you must comply with Australian laws. That's a bit of a no duh but it is a serious offence coming from the ACNC as well as any other law you break for breach of not complying with Australian laws. They're also very interested, more interested perhaps than in a commercial organisation for who are the type of people that are on boards. And so they go into great depth about who is a suitable, responsible person to be on the board of a charity or not-for-profit. So the ACNC must be satisfied that the person is a suitable person, hasn't been disqualified, uh, hasn't been bankrupt, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It also makes sure that if there is a person residing on a board or not-for-profit who they don't believe is suitable, that the organisation removes that person from the board. Okay. And the fifth one is it is up to the not-for-profit to make sure that those you know, the, the, those wonderful people who take on responsibilities of, of board positions, that they understand their duties properly and that the organisation takes reasonable steps to make sure they understand and carry out those duties as directors, as board members. Very important. And that we've got a whole webinar just on that coming up. So what does the ANC require of all not-for-profits? It, it says it must comply with those governance standards we just talked about. That's the first thing. Um, it must also comply with the ACNC's external conduct standards. But this, is, this is around ethics and behaviour. Okay. If there are any changes to a not-for-profit board, such as a director has resigned or a new director has been appointed, such changes must be sent to the ACNC. They must be notified that those changes pretty much straight away, okay? Don't get caught out if you're on a board not updating the ACNC with any changes. It also says you must keep records, in particular, you must keep financial records of how the organisation has been run. And it also says annually you must report information as follows. And it's all based on the size of your organisation. So a, a small, so less than 250K in terms of revenue. So a small not-for-profit must submit an information statement, basic information, they're not terribly onerous about the operations, the programs it's involved in, and some very, very basic financials. You don't actually have to provide in a small organisation a financial statement. It's optional, but of course, I'd love you to do that. Okay. Um, nowhere in law do you have to provide an AGM if you are a, a small not-for-profit, unless your constitution or what is called your model rules stipulates that you will provide an annual general meeting, then you must conduct one. Okay. A medium size between 250K and a million dollars. 
Same thing, operations, programs, basic financials. You must submit a reviewed or audited financial statement. <coughs> Excuse me. The difference between a reviewed and an audited financial statement is just really the, 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 the time and the degree that the auditor takes in reviewing your financials. That's really the principal difference, okay? Um, again, an AGM only if stipulated in the model rules or the constant constitution. Larger companies, greater than $1 million, operations, programs, and basic financials, but must submit an audited financial statement. And there are a whole lot of bucket load of rules around auditors about their level of independence, who they are, how they're appointed, how they're dismissed, that type of thing, and what they do. It's a whole, you know, we can do a whole webinar on auditors, which we, I will not bore you with that but uh, we, we could do that. And again, AGM, only if stipulated in the model rules and constitution, but you can see I've got the little asterisk there, which says, if you are a company limited by guarantee, then the ASIC, which is the, the, the national regulator of companies, says you must hold an AGM within five months of your end of financial year, okay? So if you are a larger not-for-profit limited by guarantee, you must hold an agent, okay? So let's just go on to this deductive, deductible gift recipient status because this is an area that is often very confusing for people. Some people start up a not-for-profit and say, oh, we can accept donations and we can tell those people that are giving us gifts that they are tax deductions. Now you can accept gifts for sure, but there are a lot of rules around that about who's giving you gifts and donations, et cetera. But you can't always tell them that they can go and then claim that on your tax return. That requires this thing called DGR status. The ACNC regulates charities. Not all not-for-profits are charities. Only about 10% of not-for-profits are recognised charities, believe it or not. Because many commercial organisations set up foundations and not-for-profit organisations for, for tax reasons, et cetera, or to, to, to have a, a social purpose arm, but they're not necessarily regarded as, as charities. DGR registration and endorsement allows the not-for-profit to validly accept donations so that donors can claim a tax deduction. And again, I'll say, doesn't, just because you've set up a not-for-profit doesn't mean you automatically can accept tax deductible gifts and donations. When applying for DGR status, and it's a specific process you go through, you must demonstrate your charitable purpose. Okay, very important, because that's how they determine whether you are worthy of DGR status. The not-for-profit applies for registration to the ACNC for DGR status. Once that is approved by the ACNC, the ATO then gets involved and then it decides whether the DGR is endorsed. So you've got two levels, the ACNC and the ATO to get what is called DGR status. Now you don't have to go to the tax office separately. ACNC will do that for you once it has registered you, okay? But you quite often, Many organisations get letters back from the tax office wanting more information about your, your, social, your social or charitable purpose, okay? The DGR system was reformed in 2017 and even recently as December 2021, there have been some changes to it. So if you're considering getting DGR status, perhaps get somebody to help you, but certainly go to the ACNC website where they explain how it all works, okay? The constitution, now I'm not gonna go through this very wordy slide. The constitution is usually the term we refer to in a company li limited by guarantee, a larger not-for-profit. For associations and unincorporated and incorporated associations that are governed by state law, they're what we call model rules. And those rules are generally downloadable from the particular state government website. They both do the same job though. Firstly, they define things as what's the name of the company? What's the objects of the association? And it's this area here that is defines the social, social purpose of the organization. 
And it is here that if you're just setting up a not-for-profit, you must spend time on this piece. And when you think about it, you're setting up a not-for-profit for a purpose. So it is actually an important piece of work that you should do in establishing a not-for-profit. And even if you have one, it's a certain it's an important area of work to review that on occasion and make sure everything, your strategy, your operations, et cetera, aligning back to that social purpose. But if anyone's looking for where that is defined, it'll be here in the constitution or model rules, depending on the type of um, organisation that you are. It also defines membership. How do you join? How does a member join? What's the member's liability? As I said, it's generally very minor, say $10, $100 for a big organisation, perhaps. It defines how records are kept. Audit, the whole audit piece is described in here. It also defines whether an AGM is held. And if, you, if it is stipulated in the constitution of the model rules, then you must hold that AGM as per as stipulated. It also defines how directors are appointed or removed, how they're elected, what their powers are, and what's their tenure. Many not-for-profits have directors that have tenures of nine years. And some have tenures of one year. Nine years is way too long, folks. Don't even consider that. You know, those that have that really have some problems in doing that. And we'll talk about that next webinar. How the board is works, how DGR status, if it is there, how it is distributed, notices, disputes, insurance, and how the organisation ultimately is closed down or what we call wound up. So a very important document, not something you go to all the time, but every not-for-profit somewhere will have a constitution or a model rule somewhere in its filing system. So the role of the board, first and foremost, is to set the strategic objective. It works with management to set that strategic direction and then measure the, the, the performance of the organisation against that strategic objection and against community or members' expectations. Okay, so it doesn't get down into actually executing the strategy, but it is responsible for what's the direction of the organisation and how are we travelling against that, setting that direction. Resources, it is up to the board to make sure management is provided with all the resources needed to achieve the strategy. So now you're setting a strategy, say, hey, go away and achieve it, and then stopping them by saying you can't employ this staff member or you can't do this. They have to provide those resources in a very considered way, obviously, for the organisation to achieve that strategy. It must monitor the performance against the strategy, and that's a key piece. It's not a case of setting a strategy once a year and we come back to it every year and look at how we went. It's a continual process for the board to be looking at the performance of the organisation. Are we achieving our goals? Are we achieving our financial objectives? Are we achieving the, you know, our cultural objectives? There's a whole range of stuff in here. Compliance, ultimately it's up to the board to make sure the organisation complies with the law. And that might be with respect to reporting, accounting, regulatory, environmental. And if you're in a particular industry, again, I mentioned aged care before, making sure you comply with the levels of care, standards of care and aged care. Making sure you comply with government contracts, grants, programs, they're all part of compliance. And it's up the board to make sure management is complying with those. Okay, and ultimately, if there is a problem, it comes back to directors when there's a problem, not the managers necessarily, it comes back to directors. And the question will be asked is why doesn't the organization comply? Risk. The role of the boarding risk is to set what is called the risk appetite and risk tolerances. That is, how much risk are we prepared to take on in making our decisions? It ensures that risks are identified and that the management is managing those risks appropriately. And finally, accountability. Most importantly, that they communicate and report progress back to the members because ultimately the members have, under the fiduciary relationship, delegated this responsibility to the board. And quite often in not-for-profit world, we forget about the roles and the importance of members in that. So 
logically, the next piece is what is the delineation of roles? So members, as defined within the, or defined at the AGM and within the constitution, they appoint the board to govern as per the constitution. So the constitution says you'll have a meeting every month, agendas will be set, decisions, this is how decisions will be made with voting or however it is, however the AGM, how the constitution sets that out. The board appoints the CEO. It is the board's responsibility to appoint the CEO. It then delegates specific powers that the board have to the CEO and its management team. And in a not-for-profit, in fact, in most organisations, there'll be a policy called the delegations of authority and the limits of authority, which define many, many aspects of what management can commit the organisation to in terms of leases, liabilities, expenses, hiring, firing, et cetera, et cetera. And then finally, the CEO. The CEO and the CEO's management team manages the organisation. And remember, the board is only meeting once a month. The board isn't sitting there going to work day to day in the organisation. So they're relying heavily on the CEO and the management team to be transparent and report back properly. So governing versus managing. So governance is about delegating its decisions and powers to management. It's about setting risk appetite. It's about appointing, evaluating and supporting the CEO working with the management team to develop a high level strategic plan, overseeing performance, managing members and stakeholders, succession planning of the CEO, changing the CEO of the organization, regardless of the size, is a very strategic decision. And so it's up to the board to make sure it has the plans should the CEO change. It also has the responsibility, and this is very, very gray, because in governance, we like things in law. But to set the tone for the top, what is that the board has responsibility for the culture and the ethical performance and behaviours of the organisation. Management, on the other hand, they're responsible for the doing, for the managing the organisation in line with the directions of the board, keeping the board informed, making considered recommendations to the board, providing timely and accurate information to the board, Framing decisions in the context of strategy, being transparent, being responsive when the board asks for information, mobilising the board. So using the board, quite often board members are there because they have various networks and connections. And it's up to the managers to utilise those and engage with the board to use those, those networks and connections and to come back and recommend what the goals and policies to the board should be. Whenever I've seen problems, in governance and not-for-profits, it is where this line is blurred. It is where the board gets too involved in management, usually. And it is having a clear delineation and that requires discussion between the board and the CEO and the board and the managers about what those roles are. It varies from organisation. If you just started up, you might find the board is more involved in managing compared to further down the track when the organisation's more established, you'll find the board is less involved. It is, it is slightly different from organisation to organisation, but clarity around the two roles is what is important. Which leads us nicely to the next webinar. What is the role of a director? Amongst other things next time, we will discuss the dilemma of a director, which is a director as an individual, actually has no power. They have no control. They have no authority as an individual. They only have authority as a board. The board collectively makes decisions. In directors do not individually make decisions. However, director as an individual carries the duties, responsibilities, accountabilities, and I should underline this word, liabilities as an individual and there's the dilemma so a director can't act on their own as a director but they take the rap individually as a director so we'll talk about that at our next webinar because it's uh it's very important that if you're going on to a board 
as a director, as a management committee, and it doesn't matter whether you're small, medium or large, there still resides. Duties, responsibilities, accountabilities, liabilities remain exactly the same. And so it's important you go in with your eyes open. And there are many wonderful people who volunteer their time because they are, you know, it's what I love about not-for-profits. Not they, they go on to a board because they are so, you know, uh, aligned and supportive of the purpose of the organisation, they're passionate about it. But they still carry this, this, this duty, responsibility, accountability and liability as an individual. And so it's important that you understand that going on to a board. So some more information, if you're looking for more information, we have covered in a short space of time, a huge area that would take a day or more. Uh, you can go to the AICD, the Australian Institute of Company Directors, to their website, the Governance Institute of Australia. They're, they're the two uh, Australian authorities on governance. Uh, SETSCOP, we've developed a series of business guides in governance. We've also done, you know, we'll talk about this next week, but to be on a board, you do have to have, to have a, a very broad understanding of, of, of finance, law, risk, strategy, those four areas. And we'll actually be doing later on some webinars on that, you know, some very simple, you know, finance for non-financial people to try and make people more comfortable in this space because it, you, you do have to have that awareness. And, and that's, that's actually in law that you have to have that. It's not just me saying it, it is in law. There's also the ACNC, of course, they have a great website, which has a lot of tools and things and a lot of, lot of sheets to help you through the various process, particularly DGR status. Then, of course, you've got your local state or territory government office. Uh, and they're the particular offices that govern charities in that state. So in Victoria, Consumers Affairs, Queensland Office of Fair Trading, New South Wales, New South Wales Fair Trading, and so on down the list. So, we only have a few minutes for some questions. So, uh, thank you. Anna, how, how would you like to do, do these? Yes, if anyone does have any quick questions they would like to put either in the chat or in the Q&A function, please go ahead. I might just start with a couple questions um, off the bat. Um, for my own information, I'd like to know what is the usual regularity of board meetings for a small incorporated association? Okay. In general terms, a board should meet every month. Sometimes that, that goes out a bit. And sometimes, you know, depending on the rate of change of, of things that are happening, sometimes the board determines, look, we're not, we're not actually, things are changing fast enough for us. It is stipulated in the constitution or the model rules how often the board should meet. Typically, in general terms, Anna, um, every month. Great. Um, another question I have is, can an incorporated association be changed from that type of legal entity to a limited by guarantee company? And why might people do that? Okay. So, yes, you can. You know, and it happens quite a lot that an organisation that is an incorporated association upgrades, if you like, upgrades software, if you like, and becomes a, a company that is limited by guarantee. Now, it is, it is no small process to do it because essentially an association is governed by the state government and a company limited by guarantee is, is, is governed by ASIC, which is a federal authority, okay? So there are there is a bucket load of paperwork and processes you've got to do, but it does happen. When would you do that? Well, you would do it if you wanted to operate across state boundaries. You would also do it if, for example, banks look more favorably on a company limited by guarantee. So if you're seeking to raise some finance, um, that they, they would probably look more favorably on a company limited by guarantee because they're assuming a company limited by guarantee has better level of governance. I don't believe that assumption is necessarily correct for my observation, but that is what the bank's view is. And sometimes government also want to do business with a company limited by guarantee because ASIC adds some extra levels of kind of governance standards, if you like, or responsibilities on directors that, that are perhaps a bit more black and white, if you like. 
So if you were if you're trying to bid for a bigger bigger program that came from a federal company, they may say we'll only deal with companies limited by guarantee, and that may be a, a purpose for doing that. And but I yes, might you can. sorry, I might give one last question before we wrap up, which has come through the Q and A. Um, which is how much is the cost of the registration for ACMC to register as a charity, um, not just an incorporated association? You know what? I don't know what the current fees are and I don't want to misquote. It is not a huge amount. It is not, you know, they, they, the ACMC recognises that a lot of charities, the, the vast majority, are small community-based organisations without a lot of funds. So they're not there to, to kind of, you know, fund this this big big bureaucracy of government through through extracting fees from you. I can't give you the right number right now, but we can get that number back to to the person who asked that question. Absolutely. We will do that. Well, I'm going to wrap us up there. Thank you so much, Derek, for sharing that information today. And for everyone um, with us, we will be uh, going on to our next session in two weeks time. Um, and that will be talking more about the role of a director and getting more into the specifics of what is involved and I guess a bit more about the liability and the responsibilities of directors. So thank you all for joining us today. Um, I hope that you all stay safe, enjoy the rest of your week and also want to say a happy w International Women's Day to all of the women joining us today. So thank you all and we'll see you next time. Take care.